I'm Christopher Moore, and I'm the host of Book Talk Conversations, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, as a guest uh, someone I've wanted to talk to about books for quite a long time, Shadi Barch, who is at the University of Chicago, who's headed up the classics department there, who is a world-renowned uh, scholar translator of the great uh, Greek and uh, Roman uh, literature. Uh, her works uh, on Seneca on translation are legendary, been published uh, in, uh, by the University of Chicago Press, and she has a new book out, Virgil's Aeneid, uh, by Random House, which has had absolutely rave reviews, saying it's the best translation in modern English, and it was selected by The Guardian in uh, England as one of the top books of 2020. Now, I think if you have a translation of a book that's 2,500 years old and it makes a top 20 list of a Guardian newspaper uh, reviewers list, that is a, a huge accomplishment. What I'd like to do uh, before uh, opening up is just to say a few words about uh, Shante's list of 10 books. Now, I want to give you my kind of takeaway uh, before we start, uh, having gone through the list in, uh, of the books, is that when you look at a person's early reading history, you're looking for telltale signs of what were the elements that really influenced their worldview. Now, one of the things that I loved about the books that Shanti is going to be talking about is the accidental and contingent nature of life and of language and that how that contingent nature is something that we often don't think about very much that everywhere if you look hard enough the fingerprints of the past are everywhere on our beliefs our sense of self and our community and by looking at these early books i think we get a, an insight into the book readers inner world in other words, books are a way, a training set for the data for cognition. And so with that, I'd like to uh, start with the first of the books, which is Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web is a book which uh, Shante has told me uh, she started reading when she was 10 years of age. So I think we, we can start there before we get into the Odyssey, which we both want to spend time talking about. But Charlotte's Webb, 10 years old, give us a little bit of the, of the context, the background. You're not this distinguished, world-renowned scholar. You're a 10-year-old child. Where is this 10-year-old child located in the world at, the, at 10? Because I know you, sure. from your family background, you were living in many places. Uh, can you kind of recreate what that context was so that we have a, a way of trying to put the clock back to see what you were at 10, where you were? Absolutely. But first of all, Christopher, let me say thank you. Because it's not usual for me to have people interested in how what I've read has shaped who I am. Uh, I'm not particularly well known despite your generous introduction. So um, thank you for your interest. So Charlotte's Web, when I mentioned Charlotte's Web to you, I was really thinking about its role in how I've come to think about the relationship between animals and humans. And in one of your earlier comments, you said that one of the amazing things about Charlotte's Web was the use of language the fact that Charlotte, the spider, is weaving words into her web, and it's the unusual fact that these words are in a spider's web, and they describe Wilbur the pig as um, some pig, or humble, or any one of the other words. It's that unusual fact that leads to his survival, actually, on the farm. The farmer doesn't want to kill a famous pig. Um, what I took away from that was, to me, uh, disturbing. Because when we talk about the rift between animals and humans, we often point to two things. 
One of them is the fact that animals do not speak, at least not in languages we interpret it. And the second is that animals are supposedly not rational, and that also is another dividing line between us and the animals. So E.B. White, in order to make his pig Wilbur um, the star and um, an object of affection for the readers, had to give Wilbur and Charlotte the capacity for speech and the capacity for rational thought. And it's through this medium, I think, that many young readers learn how to identify with them. They think and speak as we do. And that's not true in the real world. And if we look for that in the real world, we'll always be able to claim that animals are distinctively different from humans. So Charlotte's Web both introduced me into the world of animals and their potential suffering and the practical facts of what goes on on a farm. Um, but it also laid out for me the traditional distinctions between the animal and the human and how in order to transcend these, E.B. White basically had to make his pig and his spider and all the other barn animals human. I, I think that's a very interesting uh, starting point. Where were you living at the time when you uh, first uh, came across Charlotte's Web. Was it a gift from your mother or father or teacher or? You can't remember that the first book I actually remember getting as a gift was a children's version of the Odyssey from my father, which was right. interesting because my father traveled all the time and usually didn't bring me gifts. But um, for some reason, this appealed to him. Charlotte's Web. Um, gosh, I don't know who can remember when they read Charlotte's Web. It's so ingrained in our childhood experience. Right. Yes. It, wh one of the things that I thought, uh, looking at that book in context of the other books that are on your list, is really the the use of of the web. I mean, what's what's interesting is the the web becomes a structure of language that allows communications across the species, and not just between Charlotte and and, and Wilbur. The spider is able to use a structural architecture from nature and to adapt and adjust that architecture in such a way to reach out, to touch other people. And that so shocked uh, people at the, at the fair that basically the second farmer, which had Wilbur decided this celebrity pig should not be slaughtered for bacon, but was able to have its own personality. Suddenly the animal was just not walking meat to be harvested, but a personality. Someone that had worth and individuality, had feelings, had hopes, had dreams. Charlotte weaved Wilbur's dreams, his personality, his wants in such a way that he's humanized. He's not just a pig. And so as a result, there you have, the, at age 10 years old, a paradigm of how language structure, once it's there, you have to alter what you weave in the structure. The main thing is to start with the structure. And it, to me, that's what I think E.P. White provided someone like you to go on from, to see this kind of way that you weave language from what is a natural capacity, in which we don't think of a spider's web as having a language facility. That's what E.P. White opened up, it seems to me, for maybe a 10-year-old who may have been in London at the time. Here is a world of language, and here is a way of communication. Animals are not that other. They just have a different way of communicating with us. And if we listen to that, we can hear the voice. And the voice comes from nature. The structure of language doesn't come from beyond. It comes from an innate nature that he's evolved. Christopher, that is such a beautiful story. 
but I'm going to push back against it a little bit, which okay. is that um, it's not actually Wilbur who is able to express himself. It's Charlotte, the spider, who does it for him. And it's very ironic, I think, given the present circumstances, that she does it through a web, right? The web is the medium, the medium of communication, sure. like the World Wide Web today. Um, so yes, um, she takes advantage, the, the spider takes advantage of this amazing ability to communicate cross species, which um, I think we could honor today if we wanted to, but we don't. So language isn't the medium of cross species interaction, of course, it's um, empathy and it's the capacity to suffer, right? And um, while Charlotte's Web made me think about animals as human-like beings, it also, I think, in the end, reinforces the fact that uh, because animals cannot manipulate logic or language, we inevitably think that they are different or lesser. And um, if, if you want me to go into this whole etiology of this thought, I can certainly do so, which is that, um, in the Western philosophical tradition, going all the way back to Plato, there are certain characteristics that are set to separate humans from animals in a very absolute way. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe on a Christian reading, it would be the soul or the capacity to do good. Mm -hmm. But on this Platonic reading, it's that animals are dumb brutes and humans are godlike in their manipulation, again, of, of logic and language. And I think we need to get rid of logic and language um, because I, as, as ways of thinking about animals, because I think it's actually a impediment now. So on the one hand, E.B. White led us into the mind of animals and create a lot of, created a lot of empathy there. But on the other hand, on second thoughts as an older person, I feel like the only way he was able to do this was by giving animals what they lack, which is not gonna be a solution. And I should also preface all of this by saying I am, um, or would like to be, uh, a very um, animal rights type person who has read Jonathan Safran Foer and Steven Pinker and um, who really deplores what's going on in factory farms today. So that is my whole connection to Charlotte's Web. The question of, uh, is the only reason we're treating animals differently the fact that they don't speak? And if that's it, should that really be the reason? Wouldn't maybe something like the capacity to have empathy, which we know animals have, shouldn't that maybe be an alternative reason? Hmm. I, that's a very good I'm point. I'm sorry, I, I've I think stuck the, you into my pro-animal discourse here, clearly. No, no, that, that, that's fine. I, I, I think it's a very valid way of interpreting uh, this particular classic uh, piece of literature. I think. Part of it as well, and I, I'd be interested in your view, uh, is whether it's also uh, a book about power and language. Because humans had power over Wilbur, and Wilbur was going to be slaughtered first and at, the, at Fern's uh, main farm. She manages to save him. And then the second time is at the county fair and he saved a second time. So in a sense, he spared the ax because of the word. And there's a certain kind of power there that comes from language. To think that the reason Wilbur was spared had not so much to do with Wilbur, but his friendship with a spider named Charlotte. And Charlotte, through the power of manipulating that web, was able to express words those words stop the sword from ending Wilbur's life. Now that I think is a, a relatively beautiful story that leads into your entire career because many of the books that you have on your list are about this dance between power, authority, and language and how we navigate in a quite uncertain, accidental, contingent world, step by step, and how our language in some ways is our guide through those blind alleys. That's 
very interesting, and I think you've raised a number of issues. One of them is the relationship of language to power, and we can certainly talk about um, the wielding of language, um, the wielding of propaganda, the wielding of attractive national narratives um, in order to create and sustain certain kinds of power. But we could also talk about the way in which our relationship to the world is inevitably mediated by language. And what I mean by that is not something quite so blunt as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis that says essentially that our experience of the world is only language and that shapes our, our mental perspective as well, but something slightly subtler, which um, one understands immediately upon learning foreign languages, which is that um, the way language structures um, one's experience of reality from culture to culture is really different. And just to give a few examples from Mandarin, where I was so struck by this, you know, first I learned certain terminology like ma shang, which means immediately. And then I learned that it actually means on horseback. So here we have a remnant of the ancient culture where the quickest way to get to somewhere was on horseback, not by foot or running. Or the um, the Chinese word for contradiction, which is mao dun, which means sword and shield, right? It's very concrete. And that comes from an old story that said a man was selling, um, I hope it's still on screen, he was selling swords that could pierce through any shield but he was also selling shields that could withstand any sword. And out of that story came the idea of, of a contradiction being based on sword and shield. So here, um, embedded in the language are cultural artifacts and insights into history. And I love that. And I think that's true of any language and that by learning other languages, you are in effect partially learning other points of view. Now, I'm not sure if we could say that of, of Wilbur and Charlotte. Um, I, I've never really known where Charlotte got her capacity to write English from. Maybe Mandarin well, it, would have been it, harder, I don't know, but. It, but it's an interesting idea to explore because in a sense, what Charlotte is doing is she's a translator. She has to translate into a human language. So that in a sense is your first introduction to translation. And this way, you have to translate in such a way to touch other people emotionally. To save someone from the sword is to make an emotional appeal. It's an, it's an appeal that humanizes the person you're, or the animal you're, you're seeking to, to save. I think you know, one of the things that was interesting is about when the owner of the pig asked the doctor about this miracle of, of a spider being able to use language to communicate all these wonderful characteristics of Wilbur the pig. How, how can this be? And, and the doctor's uh, reply was simply, the real miracle is that from nature, a spider can make a web. To make a web itself is a miracle. It's less of a miracle to use that web once it's structured for other purposes, because that's what evolution does. It gives us the original structure, which we can then adapt. So look, the, the thing is, is now you read this when you were 10. And oh, what, before we go <clears throat> back to that, one further point about uh, Charlotte's Web, which I think is very important. And I want your view on that is the ending, where not to be a spoiler, yeah. but Charlotte dies, uh, and I, I mentioned that I was going to have this conversation with you to a, a friend, an Australian. He says, I read that when I was 11, and I'm a boy, I cried. I think this ending made a lot of people cry, and it still does today. And part of it is her 500 and 514 offsprings suddenly go off into the wind into these little balloons of webs. In other words, carrying that heritage. In other words, why Charlotte died, she was regenerated 514 times through her progeny. That that web was cocooned them. 
that sent them into the world with that structure, that capacity, that ability to translate the world. And I think it's kind of a wonderful message that we're left with. It's one linked with sadness, but also with hope and says something about what all species really are. Yes, um, it's a, a very beautiful and sad ending. You know, Charlotte dies. It's her natural lifespan that's come to an end. But Wilbur helps her eggs get back to the farm and they they hatch and most of them leave, but three stay with him. And um, he's comforted by the continuity of Charlotte and Charlotte's children, um, which is, um, it's really touching. Um, but it also reminded me of this famous Homeric simile that the lives of mankind are like leaves on the trees. And every fall, um, they pile up um, at the base of the tree and then every spring there's new leaves. But it's a cycle that just goes by and by and by. And it's a, a humbling reminder of of how our space here, and I know I'm getting away from your point, but how our space here in the 21st century is just another generation of leaves. And I think we forget that. We have a teleological view of where we're headed. You know, we are the, we are Charlotte's children. We are the end point of the book. Actually, we're not. We're simply just um, a means of passing on some genetic material and hopefully making a better world in the process, but not always. Right. I, I think we can probably leave Charlotte's Web for the moment because I think that's a good introduction to The Odyssey, which you read very early on. Now, The, the Odyssey, from my research, is, it reminded me a little bit, well, what, hopefully we're going to have time to talk about Richard Rorte. Richard Rorte is one of your authors that was influential, influential to me as well. And one of the things I found very interesting uh, Rotary grew up, when he was 12 years old, re rather than reading the Odyssey, which your father gave you, his parents gave him a two-volume red set of the collected work of Trotsky. And so, <laughs> so Trotsky became kind of a foundational basis for that worldview. Now, with, with the Odyssey, what, what's very impressive uh, at 12 years old is the Odyssey is, as I understand, is like 12,000 lines long, you know, it in 24 parts. And when it was performed, it would be performed in two to three hour segments, four different times. So that's between eight and 12 hours of performance. You must have had an enormous amount of concentration to be able to read that uh, the Odyssey at age 12. Just give us a little bit of that that original experience you had, if you can recreate that for us, not as a scholar you are now, but when you were 12. You open the page and you're starting to read this ancient poem. Right there in the first line of the Odyssey, you read that Odysseus was in ancient Greek, and I didn't come to it in ancient Greek the first time around, obviously, but you read that he was polutropos, which means he was a man of many turns. And what that seems to mean in context is that as he traveled, he was able to adapt himself to the people and cultures that he met on the way. And one of the most common scenes in the Odyssey is of Odysseus, in some foreign land, um, explaining who he is to his hosts and through his language, gaining safety, shelter, a meal and so forth. But his story changes a little bit each time. And he, he doesn't say he's Odysseus, he characterizes himself as someone else. And so in a sense, the whole epic is about being polutropos, being a person of many turns in language, right? The way that you find security, the way that you adapt, the way that you survive is by understanding the language and the values of different communities and adapting yourself to those. 
And this had um, a lot of impact for me because I had already been dragged around the world several times and um, literally island to island, you know, Indonesia to Fiji to some parts of Melanesia, et cetera. And um, I too, in each case, had to learn to adapt as an outsider. We were never the kind of privileged, um, wealthy immigrants. We were always the half impoverished kids of a United Nations economist who specialized in the third world. Um, and um, I resonated with that part of Odysseus's experience, but I also missed what Odysseus had at the end, which is he had a nostos, a homecoming. And even if it was rather bloody, I think we can say, um, <laughs> throughout his journeys, he had a, a, a goal that was to return home to Penelope. And in the end, he did. And Penelope was there waiting. And this was his home. And what I realized is that um, I had no such telos or goal. I, I had no such home. And so the question for me became, what do you do when when you are homeless? And, you know, not literally homeless in the sense of being out in the open, but homeless in the sense that you can't identify with any one country as where you belong. And I think on the one hand, um, this was very bad. <laughs> And it led to a lot of self-doubt because you can't cleave unto any particular system of thought if there's a new one every two years. But on the other hand, there may have been good in it too, which is that in seeing the different but, but deeply felt beliefs of different cultures, you also came to understand that your own view was not the only or the natural or the better one, even if it was, say, Western, right? So um, I had a, that experience <clears throat> with, um, how to put it, um, and, uh, maybe just, just an inherent respect for uh, the values of other cultures that may not be the values of 21st century America. You know, that, that's it's very interesting uh, to hear that analysis, because in a sense, what, what you're saying is you're reading this and you're saying, I don't have an Ithaca in my life. I have a journey, but no Ithaca. So what do I do with this life of wondering? Uh, because when you wonder, uh, you think of there's a place you return to. And Ithaca is the place you return to. So all of the focus in the Odyssey is the single-minded determination of one king, one man, to undergo all of these ordeals from lotus-eating, memory-eating, monsters and cyclops and the rest of it, to reach that ultimate goal to be reunited with his kingdom, with his wife, with his son, with his people. Now, your background, when you've been in Indonesia and Fuji and all kinds of other places as a UN kid, you, you must have thought there must be some comfort in lives of people who have an Ithaca to go to. Because How they, you know? they may... <laughs> they I was so jealous of those people. I, I, would, I would have thought that maybe at 12 you said, there, there are people from ancient times who felt like I feel now. I feel I want an Ithaca. I want to follow this person because they know where they're going. They know that there are going to be obstacles, but they know that none of that will stop them at the end of the day. So Absolutely. I, I, so I can see how that would have grabbed you at 12 years old. I don't know, we, maybe you were in Jakarta when you read this. I'm not sure. I was in Jakarta, yes, I think. Okay, so uh, I've been to Jakarta. I'm in, in the neighborhood of that, uh, uh, of Indonesia. So, yes, I, I, I can understand that was not your Ithaca. And you were looking for something and... Homer opened that door for you. 
and it's it's a he door did. that you went through. Now it's also a door that I ultimately gave up on. Oh, uh, tell me about because, that. Because, well, um, I don't have a nostos, right? There's no Penelope right. waiting anywhere. And right. I think what happens under those circumstances is you give up the idea of a geographical home and you start thinking instead about the possibility of a home in your mind, a place where you feel comfortable with um, who you've slowly come to be and the decisions that you've made. Um, and one of the reasons that, skipping ahead a little bit, I like Richard Rorty so much, is that he offers a way of uniting all these different worldviews of different cultures and the resultant relativism of values with um, a stable sense of self, which if you like, we can talk about later. Um, let's see, I was gonna say something else and I think it was about language, um, mm. but I have forgotten it. I won't look at my notes. Well, I will look at my notes, but it's not gonna help me. Oh, I know what I was gonna say. I was gonna say that even before the, the chaos of this of the Odyssean wanderings, um, I was already uh, homeless because of the cultural clash of my two parents, one of whom was from Iran and one of whom was born in the US but had a whose genealogical background was from Sweden. And I think if you want to talk about the clash of cultures, Swedish Iranian is a a pretty good idea of, of just how badly cultures can clash. Um, <laughs> the other thing about Odysseus that I think appealed to me is that in one of these famous moments in the epic, um, the Cyclops wants to know who he is, wants to know his identity. And Odysseus says to the Cyclops, I am Utis, which means in ancient Greek, no one. I am no one. Later, when he blinds the Cyclops and puts out his single eye, the Cyclops screams and his neighbor Cyclops all say, what's the matter, Cyclops? Polyphemus, that was his name. And he says, hurting me. To which they all say, well, go back to sleep then, or something along those lines. And the idea that you can be no one and that this will protect you, I found very intriguing as well. Maybe it's not about having an identity. Maybe it's about um, a certain fluidity of identity. In the end, he finally announces his name to the Cyclops as he's escaping on his boats. He says, I'm Odysseus, wah ha ha. I'm the guy who blinded you, I'm awesome. And the Cyclops throws a rock at the boat and just narrowly misses it. So it was that moment of self-identification as Odysseus, which almost led to his destruction. And it's very hard not to read a moral into that in some ways. You know, what, what, what's a, interesting on, on the issue of, a, of identity, I think identity yes. is an inter interesting part because upon returning to Ithaca, he assumes the role of a beggar. In other words, a demeaning position. And even his wife, doesn't Penelope, does not recognize him. There are 108 suitors who are in the palace grounds and the rest of it. And he's waiting his moment. So there is an ability to assume a variety of identities. There is no one single identity to him. What there is is a single-minded purpose. And it shows a wonderful separation between those two things. The ideological purpose-driven person who will assume what persona is necessary at that time to achieve that purpose purpose. And that can be good or bad, right? I mean, I think the Greeks valued a certain level of wiliness in their heroes, but the Romans certainly did not. And in, in for example, I think my dog is going through the garbage. And for example, um, the Aeneid, this idea of Ulysses or Odysseus being many-tongued and able to change his self-representation that is considered an evil, not a good. So it's also a culturally bound idea, right? You don't want to be the yes. great deceiver after all. Right, right. But there was a fair amount of deception in the Odyssey. Oh, there's lots. <laughs> and, and 
Uh, just to tie, tie in one little part with Charlotte's Web, I think at one point, uh, half of his crews turned into swine, into Wilbur's, mm, little Wilbur's. <laughs> that's Cersei. She turns all his men into pigs. He's the only oh, one who withstands it. it. Exactly. Yeah. And, he, and it, was, it, it said with, with, with the Odyssey, basically the king has killed two generations of Ithaca men. He did. Twelve shiploads plus the 108 su suitors who are waiting around the palace grounds. Absolutely. And so he did dispatch uh, a fair uh, number of people in, in his singular mission of returning back to Ithaca. And so maybe returning back to a physical place does require a certain degree, not only of deception and wildliness, but a, <laughs> a, a certain kind of appetite for violence as well. <laughs> Gosh, I hope not. I can't imagine myself going back to my birthplace, London, wielding a scimitar and decapitating <laughs> people. I mean, that sounds very violent. But I was struck by, so you mentioned um, Circe turning Odysseus's men into pigs, right? And right. Kind of a faint, a faint recall of Wilbur there. And I'd always read this without thinking about it until I started reading books that retold classical myth from the point of view of the woman who was given no voice usually in that classical myth. So here I'm gonna do a shout out to Madeline Miller who wrote a book called Circe about Circe's experience of being Circe. And if you think about it, um, it's actually uh, incredibly logical that she would want to turn these men into pigs if she could. Imagine you are a woman all by yourself on an island presumably an attractive woman, and you're doing your weaving and singing your songs. And then these boatloads of desperate, haggard, hungry men arrive from the shores of Troy, right? They haven't seen a woman in 10 years. There is, I don't know, a hundred of them. And there's Circe weaving, right? And so what Miller points out is probably, you know, in terms of war stories, the next thing that would have happened is that they would rape, have raped and murdered her. And it was um, a very good thing that she turned them into pigs. So uh, there's a, there has been recently a whole wave of rethinking classical mythology and epic through the voices of the people who don't get to say anything in the epics. And that has been, I think, a, a great reimagining of the classics, especially in this day and age, where we don't want the classics to be about sovereignty, superiority, colonialism, et cetera. We want it to be about um, understanding that different countries have different traditions, that um, epics about conquering can still be taught in a way that um, disavows their supposed ideological intention and so forth. And partly no, I, we I, do this through the recuperation of our voices, yeah. Maybe that's why it's a great classic, because each new age can rediscover aspects of itself and its, its current preoccupations and values and notions of identity by reinterpretation. What, what I'm interested in is, you read this when you were 12, and I have a feeling you read this multiple times after age 12. Is It, it was a book that you kept going back to? Yes. After all, it's and my field, this, right? Yeah, but but when you were 12 years old, this is not your field, right? You're, you're, you're still a kid <laughs> in, in school, no, right? When I was 12 years old, it was my field. I was, I was a little it bit cautious. Okay. One of the reasons I liked Odysseus is that, it, you know, outright, well, in the Iliad, at least, it says very clearly, okay, Odysseus is not much to look at, and maybe he's not the greatest warrior ever, but he has the gift of the gab, right? And as a very nerdy kid who didn't fit in well with my peers or who was always the outsider, this was a possible liberation, right, to have the gift of the gab. It didn't matter if you were the worst person in her team and were always chosen last, you had something else you could point to. So I, I really hung on to that. And I think maybe in some ways I was kind of a, um, a, a classicist um, at an early age. So in other words, it gave you confidence that somehow being different 
wasn't a bad thing. It started to give me confidence. I'm still yeah. working on it. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. So, <laughs> The, the next book I'd like to, to turn to is William Golding's The Lord of the Flies, which is one of my uh. favorites as, as well. And to see, you know, this kind of, t again, the tension bes between civilization and power of, and, and th we're starting to kind of, it seems to me, develop a, l a little bit of uh, a notion that your reading has been about journey, tragedy, destiny, cruelty, authority, control, miracles, gods, and natures. And I think the Lord of depressing. the Flies. Well, it's not so much depressing. You know, sometimes when you have a realistic view of the world, other may, may think it's depressing. But if you're reading li literature closely, what it's saying is tragedy is always nearby. Be prepared try to understand more deeply that this is not personal to you. This is the nature of living in a contingent world that you can't control. The circumstances... Okay, you are channeling so, Martha Nussbaum, Richard Rorty, William Golding, and a bunch of other people all at the same time. And they're all saying slightly different things, but you're, you're touching all of them. So this is a ginormous topic, right? <laughs> in other words, well, the I, contingency is of life. Um, is it or is it not so overwhelming that it will destroy your, your values? Correct. And in one of the other readings, um, well, it's actually Martha Nussbaum's reading of Hecuba in The Fragility of Goodness. She's, she shows a woman who is absolutely convinced that nobility of purpose, not nobility of blood, she talks about nobility of, of rearing and purpose, um, continues to have meaning even in an unjust world. And she clings to this belief until it's torn from her by the final act of violence in the play, which is the murder of her son by a guest friend. And at that point, she gives up and Basically, in the play, she turns into a dog. And that doesn't mean she turns into a fluffy, kind pooch who likes treats. It means that she turns into something that is outside of and detached from society because she can no longer cling to the beliefs that society creates in order to maintain stability. Like there are gods and they will punish what? good and evil. She has to give that up, just as Richard Rorty has to give that up when he talks about um, giving up one's final vocabulary. And what he means by final vocabulary is literally all those value words that can't be given a definition because they are the final word in a series of definitions. So if you boil things down to their very end, how do you define the good or the just or the valuable, you can't. There are things that are meant to stand on their own as ipso facto valuable. Um, but if you don't believe in those ipso facto words that represent your moral, your final vocabulary, what do you do? What do you do if you're a Hecuba, basically, and you've given up? Yeah, it's like, what, what do you do when you are a bunch, a bunch of young adolescents are isolated on an island. And so the question is, is how do they interact? What set of values do they choose in which to govern themselves as boys? And so what Golding, it seemed to me, was doing in Lord of the Flies was trying to set up these contradictions, these possible alternatives, and in, in, a, in a way, looking how close we all are to going back to a kind of savagery. And that savagery is something that is lurking, ever present. It's not something that goes away in some kind of utopian flash. Hmm. Uh, uh, that the, the, the Lord of the Flies is about that descent and the attempt 
to cushion that dissent in this community of young boys? Absolutely. And one of the great things about Lord of the Flies is that the community of young boys are British. And that goes along with all the um, associations of that period when Golding was writing, was that I think it was in the 60s. Um, you know, yeah. stiff upper lip, the epitome of civilization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what the allegory seems to me to be about is essentially a political allegory, because the first thing these boys do when they decide to organize themselves on the island is essentially they set up a democracy, um, not unlike Athenian democracy, in which whoever holds the conch, the shell, has the right to speak. Sure. And this is actually like the scepter in the Iliad. Um, but despite the starting point, as you know, they disintegrate through um, essentially the lust for personal power that is felt only among a few, but it's enough to throw the system into disarray. The conch gets destroyed. Um, the unpopular boys are murdered, at least two of them. And um, it becomes the the rule of the tyrant, right? Jack the tyrant. Um, and what's curious about this, this disintegration of democracy into tyranny, is that it's a theme that's echoed so often in ancient Greek political writing, where in Plato, for example, democracy always ends up as tyranny. And how is that? Well, democracy slowly disintegrates into a political system in which demagogues take over because the people no longer are interested in contributing to the whole. They're more interested in what they can get out of it. And the demagogues promise them what they can get out of it, lower taxes, say. And um, at this point, the values of the state are completely undermined by personal greed. And then inevitably the demagogue claims that he's in danger from enemies and needs a personal bodyguard. And you might be thinking about January 6th here in that quote unquote personal bodyguard. And um, through that bodyguard, the tyrant who was previously a democratic leader seizes power and democracy evolves as is its nature to. Um, and, you know, people have said this is simplistic, and it is is—it is simplistic, but I think we were giving a harrowing insight into what that might look like um, at the end of this past presidency, where the democratically elected leader seemed determined to hang on to power at all costs. And there are, across the world, democratically elected leaders who do that, those are illiberal democracies, democracies in which somebody is democratically voted into power, but who afterwards does not sustain the values of liberal democracy, like um, the right to a trial, the right to free expression, the right to oppress, and so forth. You know, what's interesting about the, the, the Lord of the Flies is that not long into the book, you really descent into the world of these adolescent boys. What's interesting, again, is our endings in books. The endings in Lord of Flies is being rescued by adults. And suddenly they all become little 12, 11, 12 year old boys again, crying and whiny and emotional. You know, all of that hubris, all of those mm -hmm. tactics and planning by Jack, the, the tyrant, uh, <clears throat> Ralph, who was the Democrat, who's now dead, <clears throat> all of these things quickly fade into the background. So in the real world, there is no rescue ship that comes to the island that brings the boys back into civilization. Aha. Uh -huh. I would say there in the real world, there is a rescue ship, but it looks exactly like what it's come to rescue. So that Navy officer who finds um, Gosh, who is it who's collapsed at his feet? One of the boys. Um, he says something like, oh yeah, he's so disappointed that British boys should be so yeah. savage, right? You know, yes. like that. And then he turns around and he looks behind him at his own warship, which sure. is what he came to the island on. And the, the book is set in the middle of an unspecified war where people are apparently, as 
wars encouraged, killing each other um, for no good reason, except for the extension of the power of the people who lead the country. So um, the British officer may seem to represent a rescue back into civilization, but what we really end up, I think, seeing is that civilization writ large is the same thing as the island of the boys writ small. I think it's a good point. In other words, there is no rescue. There, there's only the illusion of being rescued because you're being rescued by people in power who, who basically are using means of destruction, which are vastly more effective as killing machines than these young boys on an island. At least in this novel, yes. <clears throat> yes. A bit of a bleak vision. Yeah, it's a bit of a, and again, you 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 read this at age twelve, about the same time you were you were reading the Odyssey. So, how did the, how did the book come to you? Was it a gift from your father or your mother or school library or? You know, Christopher, I I know you, I knew that you were going to be asking me questions like this, and even with forethought, I wasn't able to answer them because mm -hmm. I read like a maniac the whole time, and I can't remember how specific books came to me. I was a kid who got into trouble when the parents did a sudden check at 3 a.m. and their daughter was hiding under the covers with a flashlight reading. That was me. I mean, they took the book away and they yelled at me and said, get some sleep. Um, so I, I can't answer your question about the circumstances that well, but I can say that um, it raised all these um, questions that are perennial questions that are still around today, which is, which are, um, well, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna bite the bullet. Um, is democracy always the best bet? Right, right. I think it's a very real question. And it's a question that certainly the first three books have, have answered. And uh, have answers to, um, and the the fourth book, uh, Arrow of God, by ah. Chinua uh, Achebe, is a, a wonderful, yes. wonderful book. It's uh, amazing. It, uh, it's an uh, absolutely uh, amazing piece piece of literature, which takes us into the whole realm of again, democracy, civilization, colonialization, and the contradictions that come, as along with. I think one of the things that uh, I know you've written about uh, with regard to language, perhaps one of the, one of the more compelling parts of Arrow of God is the worst part of, of colonialization was to dismantle the language of belief of local people. Because once Absolutely. you deprive deprive them of their belief system by taking away their language of expression and trying to substitute another language. Absolutely. You create an, em an emptiness, a void. And that's what this book is about, of, of someone, at, you know, the, the local I Igbo uh, priest, Izulu, who yeah, is tried Izulu? to yes. preserve his, his local traditions and belief systems because, you know, they, they had this notion of duality, right? For There's everything that, that exists, a, something yes. stands beside it. Everything that exists, something stands beside it. That the, the, the supernatural world, the dead and the unborn and the living are all interconnected. And their language, like Charlotte's Web, weaved a language around that structure of belief. And what the colonial part of the book suggests is basically that whole web was destroyed and a new one put in totally alien to the people of this village and of this tribe. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, the, um, the vision that book offers of, of the British uh, missionaries imposing their view of Christianity to the religion of the Igbos is um, really a, a kind of a shocking and disturbing thing. And 
in some ways, ultimately, the, the joke is on the British, because when the Igbos finally convert to Christianity, at least in the generation that converts to Christianity, sure. um, they do so because they decided that their own most recent god, Ulu, has failed with the crops. And so now they're going to try a different god, which is this, you know, Christian sure. god and the, the sun and so forth, S-O-N, sun. Um, but um, the Igbo in his novels do change gods whenever a god is shown to fail. And so their adoption of the Christian god in a way is a, is a continuation of that tradition until the next generation where the Christian god just becomes what's normal for them. And the whole, the whole edifice of Igbo custom and Igbo belief is dismantled. Um, one of the reasons that book was so important to me, apart from the obvious reason that it shows the, the difficulty of cultures talking to each other across belief structures um, and the untranslatability of, of one religious language into another, is that um, I taught it in a class once, um, and um, there's a very moving scene in the book in which a particular man's um, spirit manifestation, I can't remember if it's a stick or a sculpture, but it's broken by his enemy. And as this is broken, his, his soul, his spirit is broken. He looks at it, he feels dead. You know, it, it's like the, um, the Aboriginal boy in Walkabout who thinks he sees death in the eyes of the Western girl looking at him and who then dies, right? So it's a very strong um, belief structure in the supernatural that is very closely tied to your own welfare. And I was talking about this in class and not only could I see that a lot of the students didn't get it, but some of them thought it was funny. Like this is so ridiculous. How could somebody be crushed because a stick was broken? And, um, that hurt. That was painful for me. I, I didn't want to be in a society where people would think that. I wanted to be in a society where, as it were, we would honor each other's sticks, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Each other's sacred values. Yeah. Well, it's a, it, a little bit, uh, again, the, the, the symbolism, uh, again, of, of uh, Lord of the Flies with the couch, the, the shell. Once you hold that, you have a certain status to speak. Not just to speak, to, but to, to be heard, to be listened to. And in some ways, <clears throat> the irony between these two books, between uh, Arrow of God and Lord of the Flies, again, it's ways of dealing with savagery, that there is at core a potentially barbaric nature that every culture has a way of trying to address. But if you knock that out and you see what happens with trying having a war of replacement of value system in Lord of the Flies and you see when it's imposed from a from a colonial point of view that you have to deal with savagery in our belief system your system oh, is absolutely. one that doesn't work and and to me that's that's the essence of of, of that beautiful book arrow of God is that each Absolutely. culture has its own way of dealing with the savage nature that we are and the contingencies of life within that nature. And when the um, Christians imposed their beliefs on the Igbos, on the Igbo, singular, I think uh, that is another form of savagery. I think that we are led to ask, who are the real savages here? The ones who want to be left alone or the ones who want to impose their belief system on others? Right. So that uh, talking about belief systems, I think we can probably go to Sophocles' Antigone, which is, again, uh, a clash of beliefs, a clash of, of authority, of control, of power. Again, very much in the theme of the uh, the previous uh, books uh, that uh, formed your worldview. So tell us a little bit about Sophocles and Antigone in terms of your development. Uh, you, you read this in your in your twenties, and you know it goes back again. It's an ancient uh, play from 441 BC, 
and like Odysseus. What was interesting about the, the, the original works, now this is the fifth, and two out of those come out of a tradition of oral storytelling, pre-print, really pre, pre-manuscript in many ways, that these were not read, they were performed, they were sung. There was a stage, there was music, there may have been dancing, there was a kind of a participation that one had with literature at that point that somehow we we decoupled from in many ways. We go to a theater for a particular kind of play. We read a novel or a nonfiction book, but we often read it alone. We don't read it out loud. That would be thought to be odd now. But for most of our history, that was thought to be normal. It would be thought to be very odd to read on your own. That would have been a form of insanity. So, <laughs> going to uh, Sophocles, uh, give, him, give us a little bit of a background of, of how that came into your life and what impact it had at that, at that point. You must have been in university by this point. I, I was. So, you've asked several questions in one, I think. Uh, one of the questions was about performance versus uh, a written status. Yes. And another question was about competing value systems yeah. uh, in the Antigone. And a third, well, there's, there's a lot in what you were saying. Um, so just to refresh our audience, if we have an audience, um, the Antigone is um, about Antigone's decision to bury one of her brothers, um, the one who rebelled against um, the city that she was a citizen of and who tried to destroy it, um, Polynices. And in, contradic- in contraindication to the laws of the king, Creon, but of course this is being performed in a democratic context, so Creon's status is, is difficult to assess. Um, so she does this in contraindication to his commands, and it becomes essentially, well, many people have thought it's essentially about a conflict of values, the close-knit values of the family and responsibilities to the family versus the demands of the state. And that's that's kind of been a, a traditional interpretation. And um, before I get to that interpretation and, and what I think we need to add to it, I'm just going to say something about your Um, performance versus reading dichotomy, which is that not only were these dramas performed in Athens, but the space in which they were performed mimicked the space of the Pnyx, the political area in which the Athenians gathered to vote. And it was actually considered a responsibility of the Athenian citizens to go to the theater. The theater and its performances were embedded in a Dionysiac festival that lasted for several days. It was a matter of religion and um, politics. It was not a matter of entertainment, right? So very different from how we think about going to the theater, right? Just not the same, just not even related. You know, it's like, we think of the theater in terms of uh, Harold Pinter and, and uh, uh, Osborne. But what's interesting here is Sophocles was a general. You had a general writing a play. Uh, and, and so it, this reinforces your point of the interweaving of the web of the political, the civic, uh, the, the civic, communal exactly. life uh, into uh, a, a point where they can, they can see in, in, a, in a way a kind of a mirror that's being held up that has political reflection as well as social and emotional reflection. Definitely. In fact, it was the responsibility of the wealthiest man in Athens to pay for part of the production. And this was almost like um, the payment of taxes, except it sure. wasn't forced on them. It was considered a morally uh, upstanding thing to do as a citizen. So yes, very much embedded in the the civic and political uh, nature of the the polis, the city-state. But, um, and also very much a a mirror, as you said, but an ill-fitting mirror, because the mirror invited the Athenians to um, think about the corrosiveness 
of absolute beliefs. And again, I think I'm going out on a limb a little bit here, but um, Antigone does not know the meaning of compromise. She only recognizes the value of family. Everybody she addresses, she addresses as um, their relationship to her. So her sister is kind of, you know, like person who was in the same womb as me, that kind of thing. And Creon, the leader, is obsessed with civic order and the idea that um, the good of the polis, of the city-state, is the major good, not the good of the individual. And I don't think what we have here is only a clash of values, although it is that. It's a clash of what happens when you have only one value system and you are unable to recognize others. So she cannot recognize the claims of the city-state, and he cannot recognize the claims of the family. And the result is, you know, death and disaster. And I think that is really telling. There are some modern readings of the Antigone that claim that Antigone is totally right and Creon is totally a tyrant. But the problem is that's a very anachronistic reading because in ancient Greek, to have a woman, a young woman like Antigone outside of the house, in the dark, at night, by herself with her sister, planning an act that has been forbidden by law in the city, this is not a normal woman. This is not a woman whom the Greeks would embrace and say, woo, you know, early feminism, go Antigone. This, that's not what the response would have been at all. Their response would have been suspicion and a sense that she was alien. And indeed she was, because if you think about the family she comes from, right, her father is the son of her mother, Oedipus and Yocasta, that's a family that is completely screwed up in terms of familial relationships. For her to exemplify family values coming from that family is simply another manifestation of something wrong. Yeah. So I think we're not supposed to take either Antigone or Creon at face value. We're simply supposed to see the destructiveness of, of belief systems that are completely rigid. I'm wondering if a little bit, it takes us back to uh, the journey to uh, Ithaca, is how there are two versions of Ithaca in Sophocles' play, and to, to my mind. One was the, fir the, the family personal one, and the other was the larger communal one of the king. And those two came into conflict. Both of them wanted to go to Ithaca, but they defined Ithaca in radically different ways, in such a way that it was impossible to compromise. If the family is your immediate brother who's deceased, and the rituals of the gods require you to have a burial so that he can transform into the afterlife. That is the single-minded goal. If you're the king, it is the authority for the community that must rise above even the gods in order to protect the community. Absolutely, and you know what? I think one could push this even further and perhaps a little bit radically suggest that Antigone as an individual could represent the values of liberal democracy and Creon as an embodiment of the state could represent the values of somewhere like China or Singapore, sure. where the individual is not supposed to be the ultimate locus of value. And indeed, you know, why should the individual be the ultimate locus of value? In our, in the case of the West, it's because we, if I may say we, have inherited that as part of our tradition. In the case of, of China, it's a very different, a Confucian tradition, which has different values. But to say my values are better than your values, I think is very tricky, although we do it all the time. Yeah, well, uh, we, we do, because uh, values tend to get tied up with identity and so the people fight very hard to retain their identity. Uh, and so if there's an underlying value, such as democracy or the autonomous individual self, it's hard for people to step back from that and see, see that that's just one way of being in the world. It is not the only way. The other people who are in the world in a different way 
just like the uh, arrow of time, the people in that part of Nigeria were in a different structure. They weave the Charlotte's web, but in a different pattern. Absolutely, absolutely. And to destruct that is wanton, I think. I think so too. Let's move on to Martha Nasbaum's uh, The Fragility of Goodness. Again, you read this in your your 20s, and uh, I think in your note, you said to me, The Fragility of Goodness with an explanation point. That uh, the question that, that we have here, again, is this notion of duality, uh, which goes back to Earl of Time, contingency, Lord of the Fly, Charlotte's Web. So fragility is now added into this. Not only are things happening in an accidental by chance matter, it means the whole infrastructure of reality of thought and belief is quite fragile. More fragile than so people are, please go ahead. I was just going to say, so in my colleague Martha Nussbaum's reading of that play, which I like very much, the reason Hecuba, the one of the central figures, the woman whose last remaining son and daughter are slaughtered by the Greeks, mm -hmm. the reason she finally falls apart is not the slaughtering per se, but the dissolution of some of the most sacred bonds in society, like the guest friendship bond. Right. And when she sees that there are no values that can be held sacred. She falls apart. She becomes inhuman. And um, for me, this question of what do you do if the world around you doesn't sustain your values is also kind of a, a leitmotif in books like Eichmann in Jerusalem, for example, where you've got this, you know, Eichmann on Hannah Arendt's reading and this is a reading that nobody really agrees with anymore, so I'm not pushing this reading. But on her reading, um, he's somebody who simply got swept up in the machinery of the Nazi bureaucracy, who wanted to do a good job, who wanted to be praised by the party, who dedicated himself to efficiency, right? Without thinking about so much the outcome of his efficiency. Sure. Now. We know from other sources, later letters and interviews, that Eichmann probably was virulently anti-Semitic and that he, he did know that what he was doing was not simply carrying out orders. But um, think about it. If you are in a society where what is defined as good is, say, exterminating a race of people and comparing them to insects, and you are rewarded for that thought system by the highest powers of the land, what is going to happen to you? Are you going to be a Socrates or a Jesus who stands up against those values? Or are you going to be an Eichmann who embraces those values? And how do we know as individuals if what we're rejecting or embracing is good or bad if we don't have a guiding system? Now, religion, of course, is a wonderful guiding system. Right. Um, but being Christian didn't mean that the German Nazis um, you know, represented Christian values. Right. So we we humans have an uncanny ability to bend values as we need to and to claim that certain things are good under certain conditions, which under other conditions, the number of trials are manifestly not good. Um, so this takes us to Richard Rorty, right? How do you behave ethically if you have difficulty subscribing to absolute value systems? In other words, if you can't be an Antigone, if you can't be a Creon, if you're always stuck between different cultural points of view and different value systems, how do you behave ethically? And this for me has been a, a kind of a lifelong problem. In fact, when I had a shrink, I kept saying to the shrink, but, but how do I know I'm not a bad person? And she would say, well, you know, bad people don't come to their shrink once a week and say, but what if I'm bad, right? <laughs> um, which was a, a great relief to me. I was like, oh, okay, I'm not bad. But um, so Richard Rorty finally, wh wh whom I read in my mid-20s, 
gave me an answer for that. And his answer was, you have to separate out private irony or cynicism about absolute values from a public endorsement of those values. In other words, you can be cynical and say there's there's no God, there's no final vocabulary, there's no system of ethics that is supported metaphysically by something outside ourselves. You can say that to yourself privately, but it's not the basis for a society to be built on, right? And living with that contradiction of endorsing certain values, like um, I'm against cruelty um, in all its forms, I'm against factory farms, I'm against the death penalty, I'm against a lot of things. Um, but I have given up trying to justify those beliefs using a metaphysical system. I just live them and act on them, and that's enough. So I, I live as this divided persona, and, I, and I'm okay with that. I don't think there's another way to live. I think you both have to be skeptical about values and mm -hmm. enact those values, which is quite a balancing yeah. game. That's, it's, it's very good. It's, it's a very profound insight. And uh, back to uh, Margaret uh, Nesbond, she, you know, she, she characterizes the difference between Plato looking for mm. forms which are universal and eternal as the the place that you go to manufacture your values to, t to test your ethics as opposed to aristotle saying there are no forms what we know comes from our experience what we see what we perceive what we understand is from what we have experienced in the world and we have to make the best of that sensory perception in a way that allows us to have social relationships that minimize conflict, that maximize well-being. Absolutely, and as you've probably guessed, I'm an Aristotelian in those terms and not a Platonist. I would, I would have guessed um, that to be the case, yeah. But one does come across people who want there to be a truth. Um, right. They want you to say, you know, the, the things that you believe, but you can't justify, like, you know, murder is bad, cruelty is bad, um, racism is bad, anti-Semitism is bad, all these things I believe incredibly deeply. Um, and they want you to say these things are truth, as if they were platonic forms. And I can't make that leap. All I can say is that I believe in them for and of the world. But I think the notion of an absolute truth out there is incredibly dangerous. And I think that people like Immanuel Kant, who try to get there, um, also open the door to very dangerous ways of living in the world. I think it's, it's, it's right. And again, going back to Earl of Time, it's, it's the essence of it is it's a very Platonian worldview that underwrites colonialism. We have these universal truths and forms, and we are doing you a service to bring these truths to you. And if you resist that, then unfortunately, you're going to have to be punished and, and otherwise suffer. Or you'll go to hell, right? Yes. Yeah, so right. um, I think what you're putting your finger on is an essential similarity between Platonism and um, monotheism, right? Right. Uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, um, monotheistic religions are also very particular about their single truth. Right. Um, and not particularly flexible around it, yeah. Yes. I'd like to move on then to uh, Hannah uh, Aretz, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, which is number eight for, for David, if uh, you can put that. Yes, that's the cover. And as, as you've said, uh, you, you already kind of briefly uh, outlined that this is one of the important books on your list that you read it in your, your 30s, and it is, I, I think, a book everyone should have on their reading list as a look into the psychology of people who are part of an atrocity machine. The psychology uh, of evil, yes. As, as, and the banality of, of, of that evil, of seeing himself basically as a clog, uh, you, you go along day to day, you never look at the larger picture of what you're doing. It's just simply, here's an invoice, here's a statement, here, I have to sign this, I have to do that. 
Absolutely. And restricting the world to that point allows for a kind of underlying savagery to blossom. Absolutely. You know, let's get this train to Theresienstadt on time, but right. not what is this train doing? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people took um, issue with RN's interpretation, and it's probably not right, but in a way it doesn't matter because she raises a, a question, which is, can there be a banality of evil? Can you engage in the evil um, at a distance without, and believing yourself not to be contaminated by it? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a terrifying question. And um, I was more terrified when I read about Stanley Milgram's experiments, which have also since, to my relief, been apparently somewhat discredited. But as, as you know, Stanley Milgram, who was actually interested in issues like the banality of evil and right. what the Nazis did, he signed up a bunch of people um, and told them that they would be administering minor electrical shocks to people on the other side of right. the wall who were getting their answers wrong on some right. quiz or questionnaire. And there was an authority figure in the experiment who had hired the people who were administering the shots, and, I mean the shocks, and the, the shockers would say, well, I'm not really comfortable increasing the electrical shock to this person who got this answer wrong. I mean, I can, I can hear cries of pain. Sure. And the supervisor said, no, no, it's fine. Go ahead, go ahead. And they did. At least this is what Milgram claimed. And gosh, can you imagine being in that situation where the authority figures whose authority you have bought into are telling you it's okay, but you are personally um, rebelling against it? That's a, that's, that takes courage. You know, you, uh, you have to be a Jesus or a Socrates, I think, again, to do that. And how do you know you're right when you're a Jesus or a Socrates? How do you know that you're not a son of Sam, right, who thinks he's hearing God's sure. voice telling him to do things, but who is actually um, a, a crazy madman psycho killer? So, yeah. I, I'd like to ask you uh, your view I, on uh, the Eichmann uh, trial is one of the things that, that uh, comes from the book to me is the notion of accountability of evil. How do you mm. draw account in a public way? And, and I think uh, Eret's book is quite brilliant in the sense of saying our legal and technical ways of assessing uh, crime fall apart when you have something at this level, because it's not strictly just a legal issue. Uh, I was a, re uh, a reporter years ago in Cambodia covering the the trial of the Pol Pot uh, people you of are that regime. Me. Yeah, oh my I, goodness. I, I, I covered that. In fact, I did a, a, a major report for the Phnom Penh press on that. So it was, in a sense, a replay of the sim same kind of a drama of trying to hold a regime and people in that yeah. regime accountable. Now, I think yeah. you know, what, what Eric said what was very true. It's not that you let the Eichmanns of the world go, but what you do is you understand that here is a man who basically said, Jews did not have a right to exist. I believe that such a person does not have a right amongst our species. Full stop. You, that's what Aaron said about yeah. Eichmann, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Since exactly. he thought other people shouldn't exist, he exactly. shouldn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. In other words, you separated out a part of our population as not human. We should not accept such a person as part of our population. This is not just a narrow legal issue of what you knew and what you, you didn't know and when you knew it. This is fundamentally, you were part of this and your statement supported, you were, you were part of the program. You may not have been making speeches, but you believe this. Christopher, I think that's a, a really good point um, coming through you 
from Aaron. And maybe I want to backtrack a little bit then. Maybe in all of my woe and indeterminacy and cultural relativism <laughs> and all the other things that plague me, maybe one could say, um, at the end of the day, behaving as if other humans aren't human is unforgivable, no matter yeah. what value system you have. Exactly. In, in, in other words, there, there, there is a communal obligation to the species, fundamentally, that you don't single out a group for extermination. This is this is not, yeah. this is not a legal issue per se. This is not something you try someone in a court for. Th this is fundamental to the foundation of what we are as a species. <sighs> but then, what are you going to do about today with um, with the Rohingya, with the Uyghurs, with sure. um, our twentieth century history of various genocides? Um, when do we learn? Uh, we, what we learn is we go back to to uh, to cities. Uh, you know, th those who have power, you yield to them not because you wish, but because you must. And that's no, where no, power. Let's, we, we, no, no, we that's, shouldn't that's, end on that note. <laughs> no, we shouldn't end on that at all. But what I'm saying is that is a strain that goes through that pushes back against a fundamental notion that there are Absolutely. limits to power. And we see, we see this uh, again in Sophocles, you know, that there yeah. is this balance between the powerful and the exercise of that power against the fundamental beliefs that we all hold. So you're thinking about um, the Melian dialogue or the Mytilenean debate where exactly. the Athenians just said, hey, we have the power, so you can argue all the ethics you want, but we're going to squash you at the end of the day anyhow. And that's yes. really disturbing. I don't have an answer for that. If I did, I'd be some famous philosopher. But Plato thought he had an answer, which was that when you do things like massacre the millions and take their women and children, you are ultimately damaging yourself. And um, your soul is the thing that also gets corrupted. Your soul will no longer allow you to live a life of peace or happiness um, because of the, the, the hell into which you have dragged it. Now, I don't know if I believe that because you'd have to believe that all tyrants were deeply unhappy if you believed it. And I, I don't know, are all tyrants deeply unhappy? But I, I think, I think it's one of those not. great <laughs> questions. You think so there are some happy tyrants out there? <laughs> I, I, I think that there, 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 are, there are tyrants that are living in, in their, their uh, manufactured bubbles that are feeling quite satisfied. What if, in fact, this is a great segue, I think, in the last book we, we can cover would be Rotary's, Rotary's uh, Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity, which I think very much uh, fits into what we're talking about. You were saying, you know, Plato says, you know, look beyond. Rotary says, don't worry about looking beyond. There is no beyond look to look beyond. to. There, there is the now, the immediate, that you look to out of experience. And he's Aristotelian as well in, in, in that respect. He's not looking for some universal form out there that one size fits all. So that's the, the, the last of the books I'd like to, to discuss. And, and it's, again, a brilliant book and an insight into your mind of someone who has this incredible world view of multiple languages, multiple cultures, who is on a lifetime mission of seeing that we don't de decouple from our past, that what the Greeks and the Romans were writing are is vibrant and important to us today as they were then. We have to understand the context of our language comes from those earlier forms of tradition and rituals and storytelling. Is you're a storyteller and the stories you're telling are the stories that build upon stories from the past. So I think- I agree with that, which is why I think um, 
it's difficult for me now to say to hear people saying we need to cancel Greco-Roman antiquity because it's right. associated with negative values such as slavery, for example. Um, because frankly, I think pretty much all the Western tradition is associated with negative values. It's not like after the Greeks and Romans died out, we became little saints. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that's a one argument. The other argument is that for people who get a European or American education, what you were learning is deeply influenced by what these people had to say. Sure. Democracy, the rule of law, et cetera. These are age-old concepts that come from antiquity. Um, and I would never say, let's only teach the Western tradition. I would never say the Western tradition is better, God forbid. But I would say, let's use it and learn from it like any other tradition. And early in this conversation, you almost paraphrased um, something I said in an editorial in the Washington Post a few weeks back, which is that instead of uh, binding ourselves to interpret texts the way they were interpreted in the past, right? For example, interpreting the Aeneid as uh, a statement in favor of colonization, destroying the natives, et cetera, et cetera, claiming God is on your side, uh, manifest destiny, westward ho, et cetera, all those things that echo in American history. Um, we, we have perfect freedom to read it, um, and it's deep enough to do so, as the opposite of that, as a text that is deeply critical of, of such ways of thinking and initiatives. And to my mind, as a classics professor, that's part of what the classics are. They are texts that are so complicated and deep that they resonate with almost every different age or different culture that comes along. And we're all able to pull things out of them that have meaning for us. And we're all able to manipulate for the good the authority that some of these texts have garnered over the centuries. Um, so yes, I'm strongly in favor of interpretation and not so much in favor of cancellation, I guess. There was also a, a great piece in today's New York Times, which said, let's say we succeed in getting rid of all the names of, of the prior American slave owner, racist, you know, people whose values disgust us today. Let's say we get rid of all those names, right? We topple all the statues, we rename all the buildings. Sure. Then what do we have? We have no reminder of a past that was undesirable. And we have no reminder that we have changed from that past. And I think such reminders are important, right? We have to question ourselves at every generation, and we can't simply cancel the past as bad and say, we good now, right? That's, that's I think that's... Yeah. A, we shouldn't a be laundering past. the... You're, what you're saying is we shouldn't be laundering the, the past. Like uh, intellectual drug dealers, we can only have those bits which come out the other end that are comforting to our worldview. In other words, these that's world so views... That's so dangerous, don't you think? Oh, I think it's dangerous because people, uh, again, are forgetting the contingency and irony of life. And as Roy T was is saying, is what you're aiming for as a kind of a solitar solidarity amongst people. But you're going to have solidarity without tearing down the past. It's re -under it's understanding the past in the context of what how the past was shaped because the social, psychological, and technological environment is relevant. Ideas just don't spring out of the abstract, regardless of what Plato thinks. They, they spring from a particular culture and a particular time. And it's not like that's frozen in time. We are not li living in the time, the South of Cleves, but emotionally, many of the things that are happening are things that are similar that happened to the ancient Greeks. In other words, we can learn from them and their perception of how they dealt with that and adapt those ideas, those views, to a very modern context with social media, Absolutely. for example. You know, they also you, had you questions. Have, yes. yes. I was just going to say they also had questions about big metaphysical issues. 
as we do. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think that we can practice solidarity among humans, and for that matter, yeah. animals, without a metaphysics. It, 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 yes, and again, it goes it, it goes back to the Eichmann trial book, right? The large metaphysical question is, is what is the place for people who step outside of the species and will destroy whole groups? How do we deal with that from a metaphysical point of view? Not a legal point of view or an accounting point of view. Deal with it directly as the metaphysical issue that it actually is. Well, we've asked some big questions. I think we've asked some big questions. I think we have put together, uh, hopefully, what will be for uh, the people who watch this video, a portrait of inside of the mind of, uh, as I say, a world-renowned uh, translator <laughs> of, of Roman and Greek literature. And it's because of people like you that we're allowed to keep that web weave going. It's, it's like Charlotte's web again, and you're part of keeping the web there for us as a reminder that this is the structure from where we came. This is the structure from where our language came. And because that is the structure, we, we are adaptable as a species, and we can use that structure with our modern sensibilities in a way to communicate with one another in, in a way that's meaningful. Here, here. I want to thank you so much for spending the time to come on the show to talk about the books. And I think it's been very revealing. I think anyone who reads the classics will reread re them in a different way, having listened to you talk about the books that shaped your worldview. The thanks are on my end, Christopher. Thank you for allowing me to express my worldview in a public medium. And hopefully not too many Rotten Tomatoes will come my way afterwards. <laughs> I don't think there will be. <laughs> Thank you very much now. <laughs> And uh, thank you. I, ho I hope we'll have a chance to talk again. That sounds great. Have okay. a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye. bye. bye.